Mercedes and Rhea saved the show, didn't they? I'm John Rutland with my review of WWE NXT Super Tuesday 2, Electric Boogaloo. Actually, there were more positives than negatives with this show. Now, I didn't like everything. There was one particular thing that went across multiple segments that I absolutely... Let's just say I didn't like. Let's just say that for a little bit of a tease until I tell you how I really fucking felt. I wonder if you can guess what it was. But by and large, this show had more positives than negatives. It did have a couple things that I really didn't like, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. We have Vic Barrett and Beth on commentary. Sounds like a weird BBC cop drama. And we have Finn Balor versus Adam Cole, baby. The sudden death match, you know, the 60-minute Iron Man match that they did last week that solved absolutely nothing to get to this. They went nearly 30 minutes for the vacant NXT championship. Now, the work rate of these guys was fucking incredible. They did some really, really good stuff. Um, commentary at one point said Balor grinding down on Cole. Stop thinking at particular people that are watching this show. And by the way, they displayed uh, Balor's package perfectly. I know one particular viewer is going to like the fact that I said that. But this was, it was a good match to a great match as you would expect. The work rate was high. They did some nice submission work, some nice strikes. They got to, you know, where they were doing, you know, more of the spamming of the moves. Hey, and, you know, trying for the stomp. Balor gained his knee focus on with the figure four. Some really, really good stuff. Um... Balor's back was fucking cut up at one point and bruised up. That was, like, freaking scary. Um, you know, in the coup de gras, but, you know, he was holding the knee, and it was just long enough to where Cole could kick out of it, and it was believable, and everybody's, like, freaking out. Nobody's kicked out of it. And then the last shot, but just for two, holy shit, somebody kicked out of that. And then we get a Bloody Sunday. I know it's called 1916, but Bloody Sunday is better. It's also more violent. Off the top for three. New NXT champion, Finn Balor. So what's old is old again. We're back to 2015 NXT. Hopefully not, because we I really don't want to see Samoa Joe and Finn Balor fight, you know, for a number of months until we have a, you know, a random title drop at a house show, even though we're not going to have house shows for a while. They wrote themselves into a corner, and I understand why they gave it back to Finn Balor. I certainly had no desire to see Adam Cole as the new NXT champion, especially after he had that 403-day uh, reign that ended after Keith Lee beat him, you know, uh, dropping him with his BBC and then getting crossed out of the title and then crossed out of NXT and now is on Raw. And after carrying Cross's injury, they had to go with this. I, I get it. Here's the problem. They have not done a good job building a lot of top people in NXT. I mean, Damian Priest and Bronson Reed are guys that are on the rise and will do well, and Thatcher's a pretty damn good talent. And Finn Balor can have some good challengers as, you know, the months go on. One, he will not hold it for 292 days. I sure as fuck hope not. And I like Finn. Do not get me wrong. I'm happy to see Finn doing well in NXT, and I get why they gave it to him. But it's a double-edged sword. It's going to show that NXT hasn't necessarily had the growth that they think it has. Like, they're doing a decent amount of num you know viewers on USA doing better when they're unopposed uh, you know, to AEW, which is probably why they should have it on Tuesdays and then AEW could be on Wednesdays. Just switch up the days because, honestly, USA is going to want more viewers for the investment they put towards NXT. But in all seriousness, it was it was a good match and good on Balor, but it just, it I don't know, it just, it just kind of, it kind of shined a light on the fact that they don't really have a lot of top talent and they've got, you know, the same people and that's the problem when you keep the same people in, you know, what is supposed to be a third brand, but is kind of still slightly a developmental brand where they test things out. It'll work for the short term. If Balor still has a championship by the time they get to take over weekend, you know, for Mania, then it's going to be a problem unless they build somebody up and like have, say, Bronson Reed or Damian Priest take it from him. They better do this right because they're only going to get one shot with this. And it needs to be, you know, with Balor putting over the proper person. Still, anyway, you know, I've said, I've said enough about that. We get Rhea uh, talking about Mercedes in the cage match. I'm going to show you why they call me the Nightmare. And then, you know, everybody congratulates Balor, including the Too Sweet thing, you know, because the Bullet Club that won't fucking die. We have to keep doing that. I know there are Bullet Club fans that watch my show. Do not misunderstand. If you guys like it, that's great. There are just, there's just a time when factions need to die, and that one need to die about two years ago. So then we get Mackenzie with Robert Stone. He tries to bash Shotzi's tank. She chases him. Aaliyah uh, then attacks Shotzi. They knock through a curtain. Io Shirai was doing a photo shoot. Aaliyah, terrified of Io Shirai, to be fair, who wouldn't be? And, you know, she chases her to the ring, which isn't very far because it's full sail, so it ain't, ain't, you know, ain't got to go that far. 
And then they tag team Aaliyah and then Robert Stone gets in, does some comedy bullshit. This is where the show really came crashing down to earth for me. Um, and a moonsault to, moonsault to Stone and a senton to Aaliyah. And then Shotzi's holding the title and then Eo's like, you know, don't make me hurt you. Which, hey, we're going to get that uh, match next week now for the title. But I'm looking forward to it. And then we um, get Candice and Gargano and they're inviting Tegan to dinner because Candice wants to hash this thing out and... Okay, this is fucking WCW 2000 levels of bullshit. This reminds me of what they did with David Flair, Miss Hancock, and, you know, all that shit and everything, and trying to branch out and do this stuff at home, and it was fucking stupid. And I got nothing against Tegan. Candace is doing what she can, but she's not much more interesting than she was as a face. And Gargano, I'm sorry, he's just not doing anything for me in this role. I mean, if the whole point of them is to act like fucking, you know, goddamn idiots, and they're accomplishing that... But they're supposed to be heels, you know, they're supposed to think they're better than everybody, and it, it's just not work it's just not working for me. I mean, great, they're a couple. I get it. Cool. It's still not making them any more interesting than they were a year ago. So, um, Thatcher is then talking about Damian Priest, so leaving himself open, da 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 da. You know, when your feet are on the ground, you're in control, talking about facing Priest later. And then we get Velveteen Dream, emphasis on teen with him. Um Taking on Ashante de Adonis. I hope I got that right. Ashanta. I don't actually. De, Adon, de Adonis is what I'm just going to call him. Okay, that guy's got some good skills. And Dream, of course, you know, goes for the cheap shot and everything as a way to, you know, get through a loophole to get a victory because, of course, Dream knows all about fucking loopholes and gets a victory. And then he gets attacked by Kushida, who has a daughter, who probably is not very happy with Velveteen Dream. And I can't imagine a lot of people are. Now, let me say this much right now. With all the evidence and everything and the fact that WWE did not do their investigation properly because, oh, all these laws and everything and there's a loophole. I don't fucking care what your state law loopholes are. If you are somebody that is over 18 and you are flirting with somebody that is underage, you're a fucking goddamn monster. You are. And all this evidence against Dream, it's not a good look. Keep him off TV and better yet, don't fucking use the guy because apparently he is not well liked backstage and he ain't worth the trouble. He has not, his work has not been all that good in the last year, especially since losing the North American Championship. That match with Adam Cole, you know, at TakeOver In Your House was fucking garbage. And he's not worth the fucking trouble. I'm sorry, he's not. He's not. Even in, in, if any of this stuff turns out to actually, you know, be fully true, which it's looking like it is, it's fucking scuzzy by the company. Now, this is the same company that kept Jimmy Snuka on, you know, Vince McMahon even paying off the cops and everything. And murder is a pretty damn bad crime, but doing this kind of shit, especially when you are in, you know, when you are of the age that Dream was at the time, no, there's no fucking excuse for it. No fucking excuse regardless of what gender you are, regardless of what country you're in, Marty Skrull, anybody, that's fucking bullshit. This fucking bullshit behavior needs to stop. This is crap. And Kushida attacking him, it's a damn shame that he didn't just rip his arm out of his goddamn sock. And yeah, I'm getting a little bit fired up about this shit, because all this stuff that's been happening with Dream has been pissing me the fuck off, and I'm fucking sick of it. WWE needs, as a publicly traded company, needs to stop doing this shit. I'm not saying wrestlers are perfect. Fuck no, they aren't. And I'm certainly not perfect, but guess what I'm not? I'm not somebody that's going to do this kind of goddamn behavior because I'm a regular human being that knows that kind of shit is wrong. And apparently Dream thought, just because of his stature and just because he thought he was bulletproof, no, he's going to fucking do this goddamn shit. And it's fucking rotten. Everybody's got skeletons in their closet, and guess what, Dream? Yours are going to come back to bite you. It's what you fucking deserve. You're a fucking idiot. You're a fucking goddamn scuzz bucket, and you deserve every bit of ridicule that you get. You found a loophole, congratulations. You don't deserve to work for that goddamn company or in a wrestling ring. You deserve to be imprisoned for your goddamn crimes. And it is a crime. I don't care if people want to, you know, say, oh, there are levels to this. That's a fucking crime. So enough of this goddamn rant. I hope that Kushida freaking destroys Dream and just beats him flat in about five goddamn minutes and rips both his shoulders out of his socket and leaves him back. Oh, he, if both of his shoulders are out, if he can't use his arms, then he can't sex minors. So, oh, that'd be such a shame for Velveteen Dream. So anyway, let's come back down to earth a little bit and talk about Brazongo, you know, with the tag titles. And I thought the tag title picture was in the shitter before. They're good talents. They're not believable champions. So, uh, Imperium is getting a rematch next week. We then get more Dinner with the Garganos, talking mistakes, like this segment, like WCW 2000. I hated it. I fucking hated this. Why is Candace so orange? Seriously, why is she so orange? Who thought this was a good idea to put her in that kind of makeup? 
And then, um, what, what have you got to lose, Tegan? More brain cells by watching this. I did like this episode, by the way, but there were things I didn't like. Bronson Reed versus Austin Theory. You know, it's kind of funny, people say about Austin Theory, oh no, Austin Theory got, you know, he, he was off of TV after Mania and wasn't brought back for a bit. Well, all the stuff, you know, the rumor and innuendo came out about him, and apparently some of it's true. Or maybe all of it's true. Here's a question. Why the fuck is he employed? And I don't care what gender, whatever you are. It, it Like, I'm... This kind of behavior needs to fucking stop. I already vented enough about uh, Velveteen, but if Austin Theory is guilty, get the fuck out of there. I don't care if he's a 22-year-old project, 22, talking to somebody who's 13 or 14. If true, get him the fuck out of there. So, it's power versus a douchey heel because Austin Theory does play that well. And yes, he looks impressive and does have some impressive strength. He gets his back hurt. Oh, that's just too damn bad. His face was really purple. Bronson Reed was either laying this stuff in or maybe guilt has been eating up Austin Theory and he's been up, you know, all goddamn night, all worried and everything. Or sexting when he shouldn't be. Good fucking God. What the hell is wrong with people? Um, Tsunami Splash for three. Bronson Reed won, as he should have. And then we get Cole, uh, Cole talking respect for Balor, but the next time they face off, they may, you know, th things may be different. We then get Mercedes talking about the cage match. She, uh, she's going to rip her apart, basically. Roderick Strong with Bobby Fish versus Kelly and Dane. Cool, it's a feud I don't care about. It's not that Dane's bad. Strong's good. And I get what they were trying to do here, but I have no interest, I have no interest rather, in seeing this feud happen. And it wasn't bad. It just, it, it was a match that happened. Dane used his power, Strong had to use his heel tactics and his skills, and Fish interfered one too many times, got clocked, but a knee strike uh, pinned Dane one, two, three. Drake comes down because he got laid out by Undisputed Era at one point, and then got fucking beat up, and then, you know, Dane fought them off and had the pipe and everything and dropped the pipe, and then instead of shaking Drake's hand, he punches him in the face. I have no desire to see them as champ, as, you know, a tag team or as tag team champions. I mean, whatever. It just, NXT just at times feels so fucking bland. This is a feud I do not care about. This is the main roster feud I would expect to see. And like, why am I watching this? Like, what the fuck? So, more dinner with the Garganos. And we get a food fight. Uh, Candace tossing her salad with Tegan. And then spaghetti on Gargano's head. And the TV gets damaged and everything. The TV wasn't about the only, th wasn't the only thing broken. My interest in the show was broken at this point. But boy... Boy, this is bad. Damian Priest thankfully brought me back a little bit because he talked about how Thatcher's face couldn't get any worse and that he will live forever. He will beat him. And Damian Priest is a fucking star and is going to be a star for them for the next 10 fucking years. And then it's Shirai versus Shotzi next week and they're going to have a, uh, Thatcher and Priest are going to have a match next week. And thankfully, Rhea versus Mercedes Martinez brought the show to a good close. And this was all worth sitting through all the goddamn bullshit. Even though there was some, you know, good stuff and, you know, the opening match was good and there were some other good things. This was this is one of my favorite matches of the year. This it was fucking great. They took it seriously. Robert Stone, unfortunately, was there and even him getting involved didn't fucking ruin this. Which is saying something for a guy that really is a bad, he's a fucking rotten manager. He is a bad comedy manager. But chairs, you know, kendo stick got thrown in the ring. And then Rhea attacked as Mercedes was trying to get a table out from under the ring during her entrance, which is smart. That's how you do it. You jumpstart it. She's pushing the uh, door into her face, kicks it and all that stuff, puts the table in the ring. And this is really great. I'm not going to describe all the spots, but I'm just going to say this was really, really good. They cut a really good pace here. They kept teasing all the spots and the weapon spots meant something because they didn't just hit each other over the head with your, you know, over the back and everything with chairs and stuff like that and the kendo stick. They made the spots matter. They made the chair spots matter. The table spot. They made they worked it like a cage match with some weapons. And I like this. I thought, yes, it was a little gimmicked up. But I liked it because both these women have good looks. Uh, Mercedes has, you know, wrestled for like 20-something years or close to 20 years. And you can tell because she's, you know, a really, really good veteran. And you can tell both these women respect each other but wanted to go out there and really prove themselves. Rhea is a goddamn star. If I had billions, if I had like a few billion dollars and could start my own wrestling company and I could just sign just about anybody, Rhea Ripley would be one of the few people I would sign right away. She's fucking money. She's somebody they could build around for another 15 fucking years. She's got a great look. I mean, as far as work and also, yes, looks. She is a freaking striking woman who looks like she can kick your ass and could kick your ass, could kick anybody's ass and they would probably thank her for it. 
but seriously, she is really, really good in the ring. They, you know, there's a fisherman suplex spot at one point. There was strikes and clubbing blows. Power slam onto the chair from Mercedes. That was a cool spot. The German suplex off the ropes by Mercedes was beautiful. Drop kick. Rhea hitting his drop kick while Mercedes was on, you know, the turnbuckle. That was a great spot. Superplex by Rhea. The prison trap. And then the kendo six spot where Mercedes is kind of spanking her. That was funny. And okay, <laughs> Rhea. Ow! And I don't know why that made me laugh, but it just did. And then Stone was, you know, on the cage and then got taken down. It was kind of just drooped all over there. Yes, okay. That was stupid. But uh, Mercedes hit her with a cane. She had a neck breaker off the top to set the table up. It looks like we're about to get it. And then we get the riptide through the table. One, two, three. And Rhea Ripley wins. And that's really about it right there. I mean, you know, Rhea Ripley wins. Has this friggin' look like she's just so happy she dominated another woman. <sniffs> Moving on. This was a really, really good way to end the show and one of my favorite matches of the year. I will definitely praise this one. If I do like a top 25 favorite matches of the year, this one will be on it. This was really, really good shit and I really enjoyed it. And I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rickland. I'll see you soon.